Hello, and welcome to the Equity in Mental Health Framework, Addressing the Mental Health Needs of Students of Color. Today's webinar is focused on describing some of the issues relevant for young people of color in colleges and universities, and it's geared toward you, the family members and loved ones of those young people who've made the trek and made the journey to college or university. Today's webinar is led by me. My name is Alfie Breland Noble. I go by Dr. Alfie, and I am the Senior Scientific Advisor for the Steve Fund, as well as the ACOMA Project Director, which is a clinical and community engaged research project based in the Washington, D.C. area. And I'm an Associate Professor of Psychiatry. Today, we're going to give you a brief overview of the Steve Fund. We're going to talk a little bit about the mental health risks and barriers to seeking help, those obstacles faced by our young people of color in college and university. We're going to spend some time talking about the equity and mental health framework and why all of these issues are of import to you, the family members and loved ones of our young people of color in college. Finally, we'll share a little bit about our programs and services um, and those additional supports offered by the Steve Fund to the public, including you. So what is the Steve Fund? Well, the Steve Fund was founded in 2014 as a mechanism for helping families nationwide cope with, learn more about, advocate for, and better understand mental illness as it impacts our young people of color. The namesake of the organization is Stephen Rose, who is a graduate of Harvard College and a master's graduate from City University in New York, who was lost to issues associated with mental illness in 2014. An outgrowth of this tragedy is that the family of Stephen Rose wanted to honor him. And one of the ways in which they wanted to do that was by helping colleges and universities learn better how they can play a more vital and pivotal role in addressing the mental health needs of young people of color. The Steve Fund is the nation's only nonprofit organization focused on promoting the mental health and emotional well being of racially averse young people. And their goal is to stimulate dialogue and promote the effective dissemination, development, and implementation of programs and strategies to help build more understanding and to help build a better knowledge base around mental health and emotional well-being for young people of color in college. So what are some of the issues faced by our young people of color in the college and university setting? We're gonna share quite a bit of statistics with you to help give context and really flesh out and paint the picture of what our young people are dealing with on college and university campuses. The National Center for Education Statistics is where all of the data comes from that you see here. And what this data tells us is that there have been steady increases in the numbers of young people who attend college. There have been steady increases in the proportion of those young people who identify as students of color. So as you can see, overall about 20.2 million students were anticipated to attend U.S. colleges and universities in the 15 years between 2000 and 2015. Along those lines, what we find is that students of color, which is probably no surprise, are underrepresented among those who are in colleges and universities both at the student level, as you can see from the statistics shown here, also from the National Center for Education Statistics, and as a proportion of faculty who are comprised of people of color. So as you can see, for American Indian, Alaska Native, there's fewer than 1% of individuals of this racial ethnic background who are faculty on colleges and university campuses. And that has significant impacts for young people who also identify from, their back, from that background who are on college and university campuses, as we'll discuss a bit later. We sometimes use a campus ecology perspective to place the student 
within the context of what happens to him or her or what they encounter on the college campus within the university setting. At the center of all of our ecological perspective is the student. And as you can see, the student is impacted by the institution that they function within, the community that houses that institution, and the public that comprises that community. And it's a bi-directional relationship because just as the student impacts the institution, the community, and the public, those three entities also impact our young people, as we'll describe and discuss in the next slide. So stress is a huge issue that impacts all of us, all of those of us who are watching this presentation today, we can each relate to what it means to encounter stress. And we recognize that stress does not discriminate. However, for young people of color, there are unique ways in which stress impacts them in the college setting and more broadly in the community. But given our focus on young people of color in college, what we understand is that students of color are more likely to report feeling overwhelmed a good portion of the time as compared to their white peers. They are far less likely to receive or stay in treatment for mental illness. And there are many young people who face challenges prior to entrance in college. And for those young people, they have additional stressors compared to their peers that they must contend with which sometimes can compound the negative impacts of untreated mental illness. The Healthy Mind Study is a national survey that's been going on for about 10 years. It is nationwide and it, it comprises colleges and universities of different sizes, private and public. It includes Latino serving institutions, uh, historically black colleges and universities, and predominantly white institutions. And through this annual survey that is based in web-based technology, we're able to learn and understand more about mental health from the perspective of students themselves, their service utilization, and other issues such as campus climate among undergraduate and graduate students in the United States. The Healthy Mind Study is based out of the University of Michigan and is run by a person named Dr. Daniel Eisenberg and his team. So what have we learned from the Healthy Mind Study over the years? Well, we understand that unsurprisingly, some of the most vulnerable populations to stress um, and its antecedents are low-income students, students who identify as first generation, and students of color who can be of any of those other groups. We also understand, unsurprisingly, that students who have significant financial struggles are those who identify as under-resourced, face a unique set of challenges. In the Healthy Mind study specifically, college students who identify as Latinx report higher levels of depression than Asian Asian American, Black African American, multiracial, or white students. And finally, again, which is probably no surprise, students who identify as LGBTQ, who can also be of any of the groups that we've discussed prior, also report elevated levels of depression and anxiety compared to their peers. Discrimination and prejudice significantly impact our young people of color on college and university campuses, as well as in the community at large. But some of the unique ways in which discrimination manifests itself as reported by students of color are the following. We recognize in general that one of the big drivers of disparities in health is racial discrimination. Often, Black students report that negative stereotypes about them contribute to an unfriendly and unwelcoming campus climate. For males and females, they report similar, but different in a nuanced way, experiences with discrimination. So for young women who identify as Black or African American, they report more depression, more anxiety, and an increased propensity to perceive racial discrimination in their environments. Black males report experiencing predominantly white institutions in particular as hostile, and this hostility 
contributes to psychological distress. So what do students encounter on campus? Well, when students enter the campus setting, we have a colleague who works very closely with us at the Steve Farm by the name of Dr. David Rivera. And Dr. Rivera often talks about students seeking out their mirrors. Who are the people on campus who look like me or who share some of my beliefs or who understand my perspective and where can I find these people? Because finding individuals with those shared beliefs or those shared backgrounds helps offer a sense of belonging and a sense of place for our young people of color. So they're constantly seeking these out. When they don't find mirrors or when they find so few that it's hard to connect with them, students will report experiencing overt and covert bias in the form of microaggressions, the experience of hate crimes, and the experiences of assaults, including micro assaults. Two examples you can see are depicted in the pictures on this slide where students from Fordham University got together and showed depictions of what their experiences are with microaggressions. So for the Asian American young lady on the left, there is the microaggression that she has experienced where people don't accept her description of being from someplace in the United States as authentic because they want to place her somewhere outside of the United States because of their perceptions about her Asian background. You also see a young black male who indicates that he cannot ever be the sole representative for the experiences and feelings of all black people worldwide. So these are just some of the examples of what our young people tell us they encounter on college campuses. When young people experience microaggressions, it has significant impacts on their well-being. You can see some of those on this slide. But just to give you a more of a flavor for what these are, young people report experiencing anxiety, anger or frustration, stress and depression related to being exposed to and targeted with microaggressions. They report somatic symptoms and negative affect, depression, microaggressions, experiencing them can contribute to low self-esteem, it can contribute to elevated anxiety, which in turn might lead to binge drinking as a coping mechanism, not a positive or a healthy coping me mechanism, but a coping mechanism nonetheless. And then it impacts help-seeking behaviors, most often in a negative direction. So students who are experiencing microaggressions and who are experiencing as a result anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, and some of these other issues are also going to be less likely to seek help from others. Students on college campuses also report being targeted with and impacted by stereotype threat, imposter phenomenon, isolation, being marginalized or feeling marginalized, and struggling with issues of acculturation. They have a need to belong on campus, they have a need to develop social support systems, and they really have a need for mentoring to help them progress academically and into professions once they're graduated. This issue of survivor guilt is one that our colleague, Dr. Rivera, also talks about. Um, and that survivor guilt really has to do with the stress that comes from being separated from your loved ones and your community and having this feeling that the experiences that your community is having at home are very different from the experiences you're having at school. And that sometimes those differences are palpable and those differences are quantified in that students feel that on campus they may be experiencing things positively while the loved ones at home are negatively impacted by lots of stressors that the college student is no longer impacted by or is impacted by to a lesser extent, which can lead to feelings of guilt and sadness, frustration, and sometimes depression. So where do students seek help? On this slide, you see that there are lots of places where students go to seek care, to seek help. Um, but one of the most poorly used, as you can see, are those kinds of profession professional or specialty services. So toward the bottom of the slide, the bottom bars, you can see some of the lowest are support groups, going to physicians or other healthcare providers, or going to psychologists, or licensed clinical social workers or other providers uh, who are associated either with the university or outside the university. Um, so overall, you see that 
a small percentage of young people, um, if you look at the bottom right, turn to uh, specialty providers. And that many more turn to their family members, including you, and some turn to school staff. There are also differences, if you look down toward the center bottom, in demographic characteristics and how those impact whether or not students choose to seek help. Stigma is one of the most significant issues for communities of color that serves as a barrier to help seeking and a barrier to remaining in clinical care for mental illness. Stigma has a unique way in which it impacts people of color. We know that stigma impacts all communities in the United States and worldwide and is a significant barrier to care. However, for communities of color, stigma often feels that it, as though it compounds the issues of discrimination, bias, and prejudice experienced by communities of color and it leads people in communities of color to want to distance themselves from any additional labels, in this case, a mental illness label, that might make their challenges or experiences with bias and discrimination worse. And so people tend to stay away from conversations about or shy away from care because they do not want to be additionally stigmatized or marginalized. The consequences for not seeking help for mental illness are significant. For our young people, these consequences are related to uh, negative impacts on their work and educational prospects. There are also negative impacts in terms of interpersonal relationships. Um, and we know from the literature and from the research that students are funneled in different directions in terms of their education based on race and ethnicity as it intersects with mental illness. So for example, in the K-12 space, African-American and Latino boys are far more likely to be negatively impacted uh, by having a behavioral health problem label, such as a disruptive behavior problem. And so when this happens in the education space, in the K-12 setting, it has long-term impacts on what happens to our young men of color in the higher education space. There is a lack of cultural relevance often perceived by young people uh, in what's available to them for supportive services. So sometimes this is reflected either in the lack of cultural competence among people who are in these settings, or it's reflected in the lack of racial, visible racial ethnic diversity in terms of who's providing services in the counseling centers on colleges and universities. And if this is the case, this lack of cultural relevance of supportive services or perceived lack of cultural relevance can prevent young people of color from either seeking care initially or remaining in care long term. This is just an example of how the lack of cultural relevance of services impacts young people of color. Uh, we can see from this slide from the collegiate mental health program from Penn State University, that there are significant under, under representations of racially diverse populations in terms of who's providing services on college and university campuses within their counseling centers. I'm noting in particular the very small percentages of Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander identified persons, as well as the really small numbers of American Indian or Alaska Native providers. So, what does the Steve Fund do to support families of college students of color? Well, that brings us to the Equity and Mental Health Framework, a set of 10 recommendations that were devised to really help colleges and universities, administrators, and most importantly, families and students understand what's needed to support the mental health and well being of racially diverse young people in college. Two organizations, the Steve Fund and the Jed Foundation got together because they recognized the lack of information and the lack of organized knowledge related to this really critical topic of mental health, emotional well-being, and its unique manifestations and impacts on young people of color. We went through a process to put together this set of recommendations that we'll share with you in a minute. And our process included a number of steps that I'll share with you over the coming slides. 
In particular, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Stephanie Pender Amaker, the director of the College Mental Health Program at Harvard Medical School McLean Hospital. Um, and she was instrumental in partnering with us to help us develop the framework. From the two organizations, Dr. Alfie, I, your host for today, as well as Dr. Victor Schwartz, a psychiatrist and a medical advisor at the Jed Foundation, got together to co-lead the development of this set of recommendations. Additional items and factors and pieces that went into producing this set of recommendations included convening a panel of mental health experts from across the nation, higher education experts. We looked through the current literature and the current science related to mental health and emotional well-being for students of color. Uh, we helped to conduct a set of national surveys looking both at what are the experiences of young people of color around mental illness and emotional well-being, as well as what kinds of programs and services are already in place at colleges and universities that are specific to our population of interest. We also had a convening in 2017 of approximately 130 higher education administrators, senior level individuals in what we call the C-suite. All of these factors together were coupled with a second survey that we led of 1,000 with equal numbers of African-American, Black, Asian-American, Asian, Latinx, and white college students, which we completed in March of 2017, as I said earlier, to gain their perspective from the end user of our recommendations themselves, the students on these college campuses about what they need and what they feel is available to them. All of these items together went into the equity and mental health framework. So what we'll talk about now is a set of 10 recommendations and key implementation strategies that provide guidance on not only what are the needs, but how can colleges and universities go about addressing the needs? Recommendation one, it's important to center and promote mental health and well-being in general, but in particular for students of color as a campus-wide priority. Recommendation two, it's important to engage students through various mechanisms to understand what are their needs? How do they wish to be connected with? What kinds of impacts are they experiencing from being on a college campus? What is the college campus climate like? All of these kinds of data points are important to understand and learn from the students themselves. And so in order to develop mechanisms to get feedback and to gain guidance, it's important to engage students so that they can tell colleges and universities directly what their needs are and how they feel those needs can be best addressed. Recommendation three, a culturally competent and diverse faculty and professional staff are critical to the development, emotional well-being, and mental health of students of color. Therefore, it's important for colleges and universities to actively recruit, to actively train, and to actively retain a racially diverse faculty to support their students of color. Training and education and cultural competence can be campus-wide, and it is not just relegated to what happens in the mental health setting. A teacher can be culturally competent. An advisor can be culturally competent. There are any numbers of ways in which this issue of cultural competence can be infused within and throughout the academic setting. And per recommendation three, the Steve Fund really feels that it is important to do so. Recommendation four. Students are impacted both by things that are happening on campus and off campus in both the international and national space. So it's important for colleges and universities to acknowledge this and in response, create opportunities for students to engage, have discussions, to serve as activists, to serve as support, um, or just to talk about those national and international types of events and issues that are impacting them. This helps to support a greater sense of community as we talked about from the campus ecology perspective. And it helps place students um, outside the realm of feeling marginalized and brings them more into the realm of feeling a sense of belonging. It's important to create dedicated roles to support the well-being and success of students of color. Those roles 
which might consist of top level, level administrators who are focused on campus-wide diversity, who are focused on multicultural issues and social justice issues. These administrators would ideally be equipped and empowered with a direct line to the senior most persons on college and university campuses so that as needs arise, these kinds of individuals have a direct line to accessing resources and support on behalf of their students. Recommendation six, in spaces where students feel marginalized and or isolated, it is important for them to know that there are places they can go and people they can engage to help them when crises or difficulties arise. One of the ways that colleges and universities can promote this is to provide information on and to help establish accessible, safe communication mechanisms, both within the campus administration and throughout the campus as a means of building a really effective and efficient response system. Recommendation seven. Students come from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of cultures, and a multitude of perspectives on what it takes to support mental health and emotional well-being. Services provided to students have to fit that diverse mold as well. And so recommendations suggest that colleges and universities offer a range of supportive programs and services in a wide variety of formats to ensure that there are different opportunities for students to be engaged. Recommendation eight, it's important for colleges and universities to promote what they do well to students so that students are aware and can access what's available to them on campus. In the 1000 student Steve Fund and Jed survey that we mentioned earlier, only about 48% of students reported that they felt they knew what the services were on campus and that the university effectively used social media, which is one of the strongest ways to communicate with this population currently, that their colleges and universities effectively use social media to communicate with them, both about the kinds of offerings available from the college and university, but more importantly, about the kinds of offerings available from peers or other students. Recommendation nine, it's important for colleges and universities to utilize and identify culturally relevant promising programs and practices and to collect data on the effectiveness of these programs and practices. So as I mentioned earlier, we did some surveying to understand what were colleges and universities currently doing to support the mental health and well-being of students of color. And we gained a lot of insight and learned a lot about different programs. It's also important that within these kinds of programs, we as a faculty, as staff, um, and as individuals in administration on college and university campuses, understand from the perspective of students what works. And that is in the vein of collecting data on effectiveness, program effectiveness. Finally, once we have an understanding through things like Recommendation 9, where we're gaining new knowledge and collating and collecting that knowledge, it's important that colleges and universities share information both within and across campuses. It is often said that there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And in this case, we think the same is true. Many colleges and universities have unique and innovative programs that seem to resonate with students. And so it's important for other colleges and universities to have access to that information so that they can gain knowledge and adapt those kinds of effective practices, those effective programs, and those effective services on their own campuses. And I will note that at the bottom of each one of the recommendation slides, you see the website for equityandmentalhealth.org. And you can go there and download a beautiful color PDF copy of the 10 recommendations that I've just described here. So as we close out, I want to call your attention to the programs and services offered by the Steve Fund that are designed to address the mental health and emotional well-being of students of color. You will highlight the next to last bullet, which is what we're doing today. But I also want to highlight the Knowledge Center uh, as a mechanism for 
family members and loved ones to gain additional insights into some of the issues discussed today. Here's a picture of the Knowledge Center to give you a sense of what's included. So you can read white papers, you can watch brief clips of presentations from some of our national meetings, you can watch webinars like this one today, and you can hear interviews from senior level experts from all over the United States who are invested in these issues. Finally, we offer to you uh, the crisis text messaging service called Crisis Text Line. Crisis Text Line and the Steve Fund formed, formed a partnership a few years ago uh, to promote and support this crisis-based texting service uh, for young people. This is just a snapshot of one of the webinars that's available to family members and parents on the Steve Fund website. There are many others that are similar, but this is directly relevant for our topic today, i.e. how do families support young people who are experiencing mental health challenges uh, in the college setting while they're away from home. Finally, there are a few notes of some of the places where the Steve Fund has been covered. You can learn a little bit more about the work of the Steve Fund there. And we encourage you to go to the Steve Fund website to review all of what we've talked about today, to sign up to obtain updates on the Steve Fund via email. And very importantly, we want to encourage families to talk with their young people about the opportunities for leadership development related to mental health and emotional well-being of students of color available for young leaders, young people of color. We hope that you've enjoyed this webinar and we encourage you to use this web link to give us your feedback. This link also works on mobile devices. And so we hope that you will just take a moment to tell us how we've done and give us some feedback on what you've learned today. We invite you to connect with us. The websites that I've mentioned earlier are listed here. We hope that you will be well. We thank you and we look forward to being of service to you in the future.